The Lord be with you. And thank you for joining me for my weekly monologue where I talk about my personal opinions of some of the unfolding news in the Anglican and Christian world. Well, we have quite a bit to cover today, so let's get on with it. The first story is that there's a rumble over in Wales between the church in Wales, which is the Canterbury aligned church there, and the GAFCON continuing Anglicans. Uh, For those who didn't know, a week or so ago, ACE, the Anglican Convocation in Europe, which is part of GAFCON, uh, went ahead and concentrated, consecrated their very first bishop for Wales, a wonderful guy called the Reverend Stuart Bell, who had been a rector in the church in Wales for many, many years and has a proven track record of making disciples and growing churches and is really uh, dedicated to the inerrancy and infallibility of God's word. And it was a really great celebration. Archbishop Foley Beach came over to participate in the consecration and uh, you can watch, I'll put a link to it in the description. And Bishop Bell's inaugural sermon as a bishop was just amazing. So godly and uh, full of gospel hope for reaching Wales for Christ. So I really commend that you, the video to you. Please check it out. Not everyone was happy with this appointment though, that's for sure. The Archbishop of Wales, Andy John, he wrote a letter, an ad clarum to all of the clergy in his province. And he said, hey, guess what? Don't go near those GAFCON people. Don't take communion from them. Don't let them in your churches to preach. And it was really, I think, it smacked of a man who felt threatened by the presence of GAFCON. The church in Wales is in free fall decline. The attendance at Sunday worship has gone off the cliff. And a couple years ago, they approved blessing same-sex couples, a similar decision to the C of E in February's General Synod. And now they were even pushing within the next five years, I've read, to get full-blown gay marriages in their churches. So if you think there's a causal link, as I do, between uh, doctrinal change and compromise and worldliness and congregational decline, please do sound off and comment below and let me know your opinions on that. And he was very, very cross that GAFCON is in his province. Well, perhaps with good reason. Now, let's be real here. GAFCON in the United Kingdom is a micro denomination. They are tiny. The continuing Anglicans are really small for now. Uh, I say this as an outsider looking in uh, with many friends in GAFCON, both in the UK and Australia. Uh, They're very small and they, however, happen to be growing very quickly. So, for instance, the ANIE, of which ACE is a part, they are really putting effort into church planting. And they said, well, they set a goal by the end of the decade, I think it was to plant 25 or 30 churches. And they've already hit the goal. So they're really under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the same can be said of the other uh, branch of the GAFCON family here in the UK, the Free Church of England, who is seeing congregational renewal and are about to launch plants. So God seems to be blessing those who are obedient to his word. The GAFCON folks did reply, and I felt it was a very gracious response. They said, hey, guess what? You know, we are not schismatics. You are the folks who have departed from the faith once delivered to the saints. You have left the biblical doctrines that have underpinned our church for 2,000 years, you've walked away from those. Pretty sick burn, got to say. Another GAFCON-related story is, I'm going to really mess up an African name here, I'm not good at pronouncing this, I'm sorry, Sami Wayanana, Wayania, the Provost of All Saints Cathedral in Nairobi, has been appointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury to be his advisor on Anglican affairs, with a particular remit to talking to the Global South primates and those aligned with GAFCON. Now, Sammy himself has been very openly supportive of GAFCON, quite vocal. Some people have described him as a fiery preacher. So it's interesting that His Grace the Archbishop of Canterbury would appoint this man. Uh, Some have wondered if this is a political appointment to try and shore up the support of the Global South and even conservative traditionalists in the C of E. Who knows? Uh, Some have wondered openly if This guy maybe has compromised to get this job in Lambeth Palace. I wouldn't think so. I don't know him. But seeing his previous output, 
he has been very forthright in his criticisms of those provinces that have walked away from traditional doctrine and has been very openly supportive of GAFCON, even hosting GAFCON, uh, the conference at his cathedral. Uh, so I think really this is a God appointment. This is one of those moments where God is providing the opportunity for a Nineveh turnaround. And I still believe they are possible. I really do. I think that God is calling out to folks to say, turn away and come back to good, sound doctrine. And I, as someone who loves the CV and counts myself as privileged to be a minister within it, although I am heartbroken over the direction it's taking, I make no qualms about saying that, it's encouraging to see God still making these moves. And I hope and pray that Sammy is effective in bringing the gospel light in the heart of the Mother Church and at this sort of significant leadership role in the communion. So please pray for him for wisdom, discernment, courage, and strength in that vital place. Uh, more C of E news. There is a new deanery for the City of London. Ten clergymen got together who are traditional Bible-believing guys and said, hey, we can't have fellowship with people who have embraced the living and love and faith decision at General Synod to bless same-sex couples. We don't want to be fellowshipping with folks who have had such a fundamental change in biblical doctrine and their understanding of the Bible. So uh, you can't call what God uh, has defined as sin uh, not a sin, and you can't bless what God has defined as a sin. So they have said, we're going to band together and we're going to make our own deanery in the very centre of London. Uh, and they're leaders of some very prominent churches in London Diocese. Uh, the two folks who released a video about it uh, were Chris Fishlock, who is the minister in charge at St. Nicholas Church, and Phil Martin, who is at St. Boltoff's. And both of them were very bold in this video. It took a lot of courage and a lot of guts for them to put their face and their name to this. And it took great courage for their eight colleagues to stand with them. They even elected their own area dean. And they are committed, they're saying, to supporting ordinands who are orthodox and biblically faithful so that they have a future as they come up through training in the Diocese of London. This takes a great deal of gospel integrity to put your head above the battlement like this. They will all need our prayers, dear ones. I know people of varied denominations and traditions in Christianity watch this video, so please pray for those men who have made this stand, because they will have targets on their back. Uh, people who make a stand for orthodoxy and are outspoken and public about it in the Church of England there is historical precedence around the place to see that they suffer uh, persecution, if you will. Uh, they, they become uh, the target of some very angry people in the liberal camp of the church, and they can even come, become the target of the hierarchy. So we need to pray for them. I firmly believe in the mighty power of God, don't you? I think God is capable of protecting and defending his servants. And this whole thing reminded me of 2 Samuel chapter 22, 2-3, uh, to three, where David uh, sings this beautiful hymn of praise to God. And he says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my saviour. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the strength of my salvation, and my stronghold, my high tower, and my saviour. Amen. God can defend his chosen ones. He can protect his servants. And I believe if people are faithful to him, he is faithful to them. So please cover these brave warriors for Christ in your prayers. The Diocese of London has responded very rapidly. I was surprised by the speed of the response. It was released the same day as the YouTube video that uh, Chris and Phil released. And they label the grouping as unsanctioned. They imply it doesn't have any legal grounding in the Church of England. I think that's really bordering on a veiled sort of threatening type of language. And so our prayers for these men are very well justified. Okay, moving on to Manchester Cathedral, where they held an iftar meal for Ramadan and invited Muslim people to come in and celebrate their feast day. Now, we live in a liberal democracy in the United Kingdom, and we should love and respect all people and treat them with dignity. But that doesn't mean we have to agree with their beliefs, and nor does it mean Christians should become involved in interfaith events which border onto universalism. 
Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. At this event, there were prayers sung aloud. In fact, I'll put the video of it here for you to see yourself. Yeah, it's not very good, is it? Now, I can't believe we've reached a point in the Church of England where I would need to explain why this is not appropriate. Christianity and Islam both have claims of exclusive truth. And one cannot be... Uh, Anyone can be right, and we both claim to be the one to worship the one true God. And despite what some universalists claim, it's very clear from Scripture that Allah is not Yahweh. So the Ten Commandments enjoin us. God says in the first commandment, "Thou shalt have, have no other gods but but Me." You must not worship other gods. Now you could argue that they weren't the Christians weren't worshiping along with the Muslim folks, but they were allowing. The worship of a different God from a different religion in a Christian house of worship that is consecrated to the worship of the Blessed and Holy Trinity. And Islam explicitly denies the Trinity and denies the divinity of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. So, you know, we ought to be neighbourly and loving to our Muslim friends. Certainly, we ought to make an effort to help them to feel welcomed in Great Britain, but we Christians cannot let that bleed into a type of universalist heresy. And I worry that that's what's happened in Manchester Cathedral. It's not the first time this sort of thing's happened, is it? Like just a couple of weeks ago, I brought up in my monologue about the prayers uh, by an imam in Westminster Cath uh, Abbey, Westminster Abbey in the Commonwealth Day service. These things are troubling because they show us that there is no discipline for an erroneous doctrine in the Church of England anymore. So if you believe something that is contrary to scripture, contrary to the traditional doctrines of the church, something that even erodes the very beliefs that make the, ch the church Christian, no one's going to stop you. And that's so, so, so sad. In fact, basically the only people who really get disciplined these days, as I uh, mentioned in my previous story that I covered about the new deanery in London, are Orthodox clergy who are brave enough to put their head above the parapets and be outspoken in their convictions of theological truth. So, and this is just yet another example of the wheels coming off the C of E. And it's heartbreaking and it's distressing to see. And uh, my goodness gracious, what? Yeah. Okay, moving on. Uh, the final story I'd like to cover this afternoon is about the terrible terrible mass shooting in nashville tennessee and i know this is a heavy story but i'd be remiss to ignore it as the week has unfolded since these tragic events happened we've learned a few more details as the police have continued investigating we know that the murderer was a biological female who identified as male so a trans person so i ought to caveat everything i say here by saying christians must love trans people we certainly must never advocate an eye for an eye. Jesus says that's not acceptable. And Christians must never hit back with violence. We are to turn the other cheek. Certainly, we may disagree with that ideological worldview. And traditionalist conservative Christians do. We believe that God made people male and female. In the beginning, he made them that way. And that the human race has a binary uh, sexes. There are not multiple genders. That's a basic Christian view. Our bodies matter to God, as do our souls. And we are not accidentally or mistakenly swapped into the wrong bodies. People who struggle with gender dysphoria need the love and care of the Christian church. But we must not compromise on the basic fundamental convictions of being made imago Dei and the traditional Christian view on this topic. It's very sad to see certain parts of the media bordering on victim blaming the people who were killed uh, because the perpetrator made detailed plans with maps and a manifesto about attacking this school. It was particularly chosen because it was a soft target. There was another school that had security that they decided they weren't going to attack. And also the Telegraph has reported that they had an intentional desire to hunt down the pastor 
of the church that the school is connected to, which is extremely distressing. This man had been offering pastoral care and counselling to this young lady, and my goodness gracious, in, when she couldn't find him, she decided to kill his children. So I think it speaks to the absolute brokenness of Western culture, and it seems to only be getting worse. And we have abandoned our understanding in general of the Judeo-Christian foundations of the West. It's perhaps most prominent and poignantly visible in the United States, but it's elsewhere in the UK and Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Europe. We see these acts of violence, of hatred, of anger, of division in society. We don't seem to be able to love our neighbour, to agree to disagree, to live and let live anymore. We have to hate and almost desire to eradicate people who differ from us and have different religious, philosophical or political opinions. And that is tragic and it's dangerous. I said in my prophecy video that I believed the West could repent and turn back to God and he would be merciful. I pray that we would because I fear this sort of anarchy, chaos and heartache will only continue if we don't. You know, it's almost, well, it is actually scary now in the light of this event to be a Christian who is boldly proclaiming the truth of God's word. I think we ought to be deep in prayer for protection, for God to send his holy angels to defend Orthodox Christians, because we must speak the truth of the Bible to our culture. There are hurting people. There are so many hope-filled stories of people who have detransitioned and found uh, transformation in the name of Jesus Christ. I shared on my social the other, socials the other day uh, in Queensland, a church with a wonderful testimony of, of baptizing in a river uh, a young person who had um, detransitioned. And we have, you know, if they don't, people don't want to choose to do that or listen to our message, that's their choice. But we should have the freedom to express it without fear of harm. And that's, I think it's coming in the West now. Many people have said it for many years. It's becoming risky to be a vocal, open, public Christian. And I hope and pray that the West returns to its values and that we turn away from this kind of terrifying experiences. We must, Revelation is clear, isn't it, dear ones? We must be willing to lay down our lives for the gospel. We must never harm anyone else with physical violence, but we must be willing ourselves to, to die for Jesus and for the truth of the word. Uh, the sad, sad thing about this situation is those little children were just going to school. They weren't preaching the gospel. They weren't standing on a street corner on a soapbox. They were just innocent little ones. And it really hit me right between the eyes because they were similar age to my sons. And I actually know a friend who has a personal connection into that church community. Much more could be said about this. There are other outlets who've covered it in more in detail, both in Britain and in the States. So I leave it to you to check those out on YouTube. But I think for us Christians, we ought to pray. I know that's not the kind of thing I usually do on my vlog, but this is such a dark and horrific thing i think as christians you know we're, we're building a little community here by god's grace of people from many different christian traditions and one thing we can be united on in our faith in jesus christ is prayer the prayer of righteous people avails much so why don't you just pause for a couple of minutes now at the end of this this video and pray with me let's pray Loving Heavenly Father, we lift up to you the church and school community and the people who have survived. We pray, Lord, for the parents who have lost little ones and those family members who, of the staff members who died. You say, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we pray your comfort and your supernatural peace, which the world cannot give, would pour down from heaven upon them. Surround them with your love and take from them the burden of hatred or unforgiveness. Help them, O Lord, to turn unto you 
and to lift up their tears and lamentations to your throne. Lord God, we pray for the family of the murderer as well. They must be absolutely devastated, confused and terribly hurt as well. We ask similarly for your grace to be with them. We pray for the police as they investigate, Lord, that you would guide them into all truth. And we also pray particularly for the first responders, the policemen and the paramedics who were immediately on the scene and witnessed the horror. Lord, those images will be forever burned into their minds. We pray that you would help them to cope and to find healing with what they experienced. Loving God, we pray also that you would take from humanity the spirit that makes for such evil. We humbly ask, Lord, that if anyone is out there in the world considering similar actions to harm their fellow human beings, that you would help them to see the dignity of their potential victims, that they would be turned away by your Holy Spirit from harm. And we pray, Lord, if it is the influence of the evil one, that his power would be broken in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. And we ask for the West to turn back to Christ. There is a balm for all of our individual and collective ills in our societies, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in him. We pray, Lord Jesus, for your church to be bold and brave in proclaiming your truth and to be protected by your angels from harm. And Lord, we also pray that you would move through your spirit to turn the whole of Western culture back to its foundations of Christian faith, of the commandments of God which bring life. We offer this prayer in the power of the Holy Spirit through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, that prayer there just reminded me that the commandments of God are there not because he is an angry policeman in the sky. He sets the moral parameters for humanity all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments, which are inspired by the Holy Spirit and given to us because he knows what's best for us as a loving parent. He is our loving father. He wants to keep us away from things that would harm us, even if they feel good to us, even if we are confused or don't understand why we feel the way we feel. We don't really need to know why God says one thing's right or another thing's wrong, because he's God. He made us and he has the right to define what's good and bad. And in his commandments, there is life and flourishing and wholeness. We ought to be deep in prayer for people who are rebelling against God and pray for those who speak his truth, that they would be given courage to do so, even in the midst or in the possible fear of persecution. Well, my dear ones, thank you for watching another vlog, another monologue of mine. Thank you for listening. I pray the Lord Jesus Christ walks ever so closely to you, closer than ever before in your earthly pilgrimage with him, that you are filled with the Lord, the Holy Spirit's power and presence, that you may overflow with joy in your believing in Christ, and that God the Father gives you his blessing and grace, even in these dark and trying times, that the glorious God of our salvation, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, would surround you and fill you at all times, and your loved ones and your children as well. Amen.